On Wednesday, Scotland's First Minister, Alex Salmond, launched a consultation paper outlining his government's plans to hold a referendum on Scottish independence. But the rest of the UK isn't going to get a say. Our first big question, would the UK miss Scotland? Uh, Margaret Curran and Ruth Davidson are here to explain why many Labour and Conservative Scots are united in opposition to his plans. And Scotland's uh, set to be the first country in the United Kingdom to allow same-sex couples to marry in church. Our next big question, should gay couples have the right to marry? Uh, prominent Protestants and Roman Catholics stand side by side in their fight against the plans. Welcome everybody to The Big Questions this morning. Well, Alex Salmon's vision for an independent Scotland built on fairness is uh, as a beacon for progressive opinion south of the border. Uh, but the First Ministers of Wales and Northern Ireland are, are more afraid that the removal of Scotland's voting power will fundamentally change what remains of the United Kingdom. Would the UK miss Scotland? It's been an incredibly successful nation-state for the last 300 years. Scotland contributed and benefited hugely from the, uh, the empire adventure. But Margaret Curran, looking at this from a, from a UK perspective, what would the removal of Scotland mean for the rest of the United Kingdom? I think it would be a huge loss of Scotland separated off from the United Kingdom. We've got a big decision to make in Scotland about that. Scotland's contributed enormously, I think, in terms of people, in terms of wealth, in terms of culture. But that will continue, won't it? No, but I think as part of the union it's much better to be partners rather than competitors. And we have divisions between us. I mean, and I do, that doesn't mean to say it's an unchanging partnership. Of course, it's changing. Devolution is perhaps one of the most important things that's happened to Scotland and to the UK, and I hope that continues, and I hope it grows strongly. I think you can have a strong Scotland and a strong United Kingdom. I'm Scottish and British. I'm proud to be Scottish. I'm very patriotic. That doesn't mean to say I feel the division of England is so important. I don't think about the English as if they're always causing me problems. I think they're partners, and I think we can grow and be strong together. Alan Bissett. This has been an incredibly successful nation state for the last 300 years. It is, uh, and there's a quote actually from, a, from a, the writer Dominic Sandbrook. He said, uh, blinkered, mean-spirited and unscrupulous politicians are destroying something special. Uh, well, I don't think so. Uh, it hasn't worked out for a great many people in Scotland. Uh, Glasgow has the lowest life expectancy in Europe, the highest knife crime rate. How does the union explain that if we're supposedly living in a these times are plenty. How would, you've also maintained and argued that it would be that the union is culturally damaging to Scotland. What does that mean? Well, Scotland doesn't know what it is. Scotland's never been allowed to grow up and mature as a nation because we've always been in this straitjacket. And such things as the Scottish cringe and the Scottish pessimism, all these things that we're told are national characteristics, uh, that's not the way Scotland wants it to be. Imagine the day after a yes vote at the independence referendum, the euphoria that would sweep this country, the cultural confidence that we would have in ourselves that would have never been allowed. What about the rest of the United Kingdom? Have you thought about Wales? Have you thought about Northern Ireland? Have you, have you thought about England and those people who well, value the union? Well, to be quite union? honest, I think a lot of Scots who are in favour of independence would quite like to take the north of England with us. There's more in common between <laughs> Glasgow and Liverpool than there is between Liverpool and London, but that's not the decision in front of us. Scots have to decide what's better for them as, as a people. John Haldane, what, in what ways do you think this would affect Britain? Well, I think it would expose a real problem for England. That's perhaps not something that since we're in Scotland today, we need to focus on. Well, no, I but think I we think do need to focus on. There is a question about There is a question about English identity in this respect. I mean, it seems to me the, the union came into existence for entirely practical reasons: economic on the part mm. of Scotland, defence on the part of England, because of its anxiety about wars with France and the Scots being allied with that. But what's happened over those three centuries is that a kind of familial relationship has developed. This is a larger community, a larger family, as it were. Now, I mean, the point was made that, you know, people in Glasgow may have more in common with people in Liverpool than, say, with other parts of Scotland or other parts of England and so on. But that's right. I mean, we're part of a larger union. It's provided the Scots with a stage in which they can move. And this idea that Scotland has somehow been culturally inhibited, I just don't see. I mean, Scotland's a very significant contributor to British culture. Well, th that's correct, but that is probably despite the British state rather than because of the British state. I mean, after the, uh, the, the, after the rigged 1979 referendum on devolution, 
which uh, the British government made sure that even although the majority of Scots voted, Scots voted yes, it didn't go through. There was a huge flower in Scottish culture, in literature, in theatre, in the arts, and that was because, <laughs> that was because of the subconscious <laughs> reaction against the British state. That was almost like the unofficial opposition. Have you ever heard of the Scottish Enlightenment after the union of the parliaments? That was the greatest flowering of Scottish culture ever. And to say that you can see echoes of, of Glasgow, where you live, where I live, where I represent, in, I would suggest, Belfast, Liverpool, Newcastle, where I've got family and friends and all the rest of it. I mean, I, I see very much of Glasgow in all of these places. And, and I think that there are similarities between different parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think that we gain a huge amount for being part of, like you say, not just an economic, but also a, a cultural un union uh, with countries that have the same language as us, uh, places where have similar background, they've had gone through the same political processes as us. You know, to break off from that but those and ties, put ourselves in those a union, ties of kinship Ruth Davidson hmm. will surely continue well, unchanged. Well, but why would you want to, to break them off just now when barriers. people like them and put up barriers to that, particularly when the majority of Scots sure. have said that they want to, to keep those ties that bind? Sorry, that's, that's Stuart Maxwell from yeah, the SNP. Yeah, that, that's just nonsense. There will not be a separation. Scotland's not going anywhere. I mean, it'll still be here. We're not floating off into the North Sea somewhere. No. Effectively, we'll only to get the oil. Uh, well, the oil will be staying here with us, of course. But uh, the fact remains that all of those strong social unions, the, the family and the ties, the cultural ties that, that exist at the moment, would continue after independence. In fact, I believe that we'd be, have, a, have a strengthened position for both Scotland and the rest of the UK post-independence. We could work in partnership where it's in our mutual benefit and mutual interest, but where do we have a difference? Where do we have a, a different view of the world? For example, on weapons of mass destruction, we can get rid of them, but it's if the rest of the UK want them, they can coming have out of a union where there's been political, social union for 300 years, similar language, uh, same currency, all of that sort of thing, to take us out of that, to put us much more forcefully in a union with 27 other nations who don't have that same culture, that same economic cycle, even that same language. You know, I, I just don't see why you're so intent of doing that when the majority of Scots don't want it. Because, because we, we would have the ability to choose our own destiny, to choose our own future, to decide our own economic policies. You're tying policies. it to Frankfurt and Brussels. We want, no, no, the fact is that at the moment we have a UK government that's pursuing policies which are absolutely, for the most part, abhorrent to the Scottish people. We don't want to see disabled people targeted by a UK Tory government. We wouldn't more have than to face that of Scots in a, a future. Uh, uh, more than two-thirds of, of Scots support uh, the cap on welfare payments. Why doesn't the SNP? More than two-thirds of Scots supported the Prime Minister using his veto in Europe. And there's also, Why doesn't the SNP? There's also another point. What about you spoke you know, very fondly of your, your, your kinsfolk in the north of England, your, maybe your, your, your political brothers and sisters as well, Alan. Are, are you not, if you want to look at it from that perspective, are you not abandoning the, the, the core left-wing vote, the core Labour vote, to a, to a Tory Britain if Scotland leaves? Unfortunately, yes, and that's something... Do you feel guilty about I that? I do, to be quite honest, yes. But, uh, Is that self-determination or selfishness? Well, I mean, it's, it's self-determination. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. But the unfortunate thing is, England continues to vote Tory. Scotland does not. There's a basic democratic deficit here. There are no Tory votes in Scotland, very few Tory votes in Scotland, and yet we have to endure decades of Tory rule. That's not good for the people. But wait a minute, not in the control. I have to come in here. No, no. I have to come in here. Ruth Because no, this is one of the things that always gets lost. Do you know that more people voted Conservative, Liberal, Democrat in the 2010 election, general election, than voted SNP, voted Alex Salmon for First that's Minister? It's it is. 410,000 for the Conservatives, 465,000 no, for the Lib Dems. Just, I mean, voted in the list. Yeah, yeah, more people 900, voted. Over 900,000 voted for the SNP and 898,000 yeah. voted for the Coalition yeah. more, people, more people voted for the SNP. But look, one, one thing we know about politics in Britain is it fluctuates, right? I mean, the, the only party that has had a majority of seats in Scotland is the Conservative and Unionist Party. The, yeah, actually, the only party, the SNP, the only party that's, that's ever had a majority has ever had a majority of the West of seats in Scotland <laughs> was the Conservative Europe. No, but, but this is my point. Right? <laughs> Politics fluctuates. There will be periods in which one party comes there will be periods in which one party comes to four another party so on. What we're talking about here is breaking up an enduring union. And now the question that hasn't really been brought into focus is what exactly we're talking about. I gather that today Alex Salmond is continuing to talk about the existence of the British state beyond this point. Now it seems well, to the United Kingdom. Of, yeah. Well, no, but he's also talked about the British state mm. and they talked about the continuation of the Union of the Kingdoms with, as you say, with mm. the sovereign remaining and so on. But this just leaves many of us puzzled as to what, what on earth we're talking mean? about when we talk about independence. The thing that really, north and south of the border and indeed in, in the Principality of Wales and in Northern Ireland, I think that people should be most concerned about and should most press is what exactly 
exactly is it that we are talking about? You can't talk about Scotland going its own way while at the same time talking about the continuation of the British state. And this idea of a social union is just a warm, fuzzy phrase. It needs to be pinned down and defined. What was true of Scotland uh, between the Union of the Crowns and uh, the Alec, Union Reverend of Alec, yeah, go on. What, what was true of Scotland between the Union of the Crowns and the Union of the Parliaments? What, what would you, how would you describe that? A period of economic collapse, basically. I mean, it was no, no, but in, in constitutional terms. Yes, yes, no, but that, but that was, a, I mean, remember you were talking about a Europe in those times. It was made up of tiny kingdoms and principalities. Mm -hmm. The modern political world that we're talking about, most of the European states were products of the 19th century. Germany, Italy, the whole trend was to create these large nation states. Right, so that's, that's, but at the moment... Is, the trend, and, and at the end of the Second World War, there were approximately 50 uh, independent countries in, uh, in the United Nations. There are now 200. The trend is actually for smaller nations in the world. That's actually the trend. The trend is exactly the opposite of what you're saying. That's here nor there. Sure, Maxwell, will this, if it happens, will this be better for Wales? Will it be better for England? Will it be better for Northern Ireland? And why? Well, I think it's better for, for the rest of the UK and better for Scotland because I think what we have at the moment is a, an unequal, an unfairness. Why an will it be better situation. for England, first of all? Well, for, I think, for example, at the moment, in Europe, let me give you one example. In the European Union, uh, the UK has, uh, has one vote at the top table. Post-independence, there'll be two votes. But you've got Scotland to apply to join, haven't you? No, we don't. Uh, both partners will be in, both, that you both do. countries will be inheritor states. That. We don't say yeah. that. That's, that's, that's clearly the case. It's that not is an assertion. That's not truth. That's it's an assertion. The fact is that we will both be members of the European Union. Uh, we'll both have votes at the top table, and where our interests meet together, then we can work together for the benefit of both, the mutual interest of both peoples, Nick, with two votes rather Nick, than one. The real debate here is about the future of Scotland and the, the needs of the people. It's also about the future made. of England and yeah, it's about of the course, future of yes. Wales and the future of Northern of Ireland. That's, that's our perspective this morning. Yes, I absolutely accept that. But for those of us who will be voting in the referendum, it is largely about the future of Scotland. Well, should we think about our of course we cousins? Should. Of course, and one of the big implications of that, what matters for the rest of the people of the UK as well, is, future, is Scotland's economic future. And I would want to ask Stuart, you know, the proposal from the SNP is that Scotland will remain part of sterling and part of the British currency. One level I don't really understand why that is set independence and separation. I don't know how you can have that and still be part of a, you know, the currency of a sovereign, a foreign power, and then you know the policies of that dictated by and the a, lender a, of last resort and as well. all that kind of all mm. those issues. But you have well, it well, let me explain that then. I mean, it's quite clear <laughs> that there, there, are, there are there are 67 no, countries, approximately 67 the countries in the world who are in monetary that. unions, mm. currency unions. That's that's a perfectly normal situation around the world. Um, they don't think of themselves as any less independent than anybody else just because they're in the same currency zone as another country. Might you want to That's join a, the Euro? Well, if, if it, economic circumstances were appropriate and correct and beneficial to the Scottish people... And That's a phrase only, out the back pocket, no, isn't it? <laughs> well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it if it was against the You wouldn't the do interests. it tomorrow, would you? Do, no, certainly not. <laughs> but the fact is, if it was beneficial and the people voted for it, then of course... Owen oh, Dudley Edwards, you have said that uh, Scotland is a country that is compassionate to the core and independence would let that compassion express itself, whereas England, driven by the English political class, is far more materialistic. What do you mean? Well, first of all, if I can make one or two, clear up one or two small points, there is a country called Ireland, which is also part of our archipelago. It contains very many people who have cousins in Britain. It existed in the Stirling area between 1920 and 1970, Margaret Curran. Learn a little Irish history. But and no, it, was able, it was I, able to I, do I, so. Um, and the existence of Ireland then is a reminder to us of quite a number of things, including the fact that so many Irish continue to prosper in several generations uh, in Britain, including the fact that you had a Prime Minister whose name most British people couldn't pronounce because it was so Irish, James Callaghan. <laughs> but at the same time, Ireland is a warning. The SNP deserves great credit for always having been implacably against violence. And they have elevated Scottish nationalism to be an anti-violent, non-violent belief. As such, the contrast with the tragedy of Ireland is overwhelming and tremendously important. So you Scotland, give them credit for not using guns and bullets and I bombs? I give them credit on the positive side for preaching a gospel of hostility to hatred and hostility to violence. And it is basic to the whole question as far as the... As far as uh, quickly, that point. John Haldane. John Haldane. Can I just remind you, I mean, uh, 
he's an Irishman, a fine historian, but look, the, the fact of the matter is you know what happened in Ireland. In the 19th century, there was a movement for home rule, but what that became progressively was something that divided Ireland very deeply. And I don't just mean north and south, within the Republic, what re is now the Republicans as well. It has to be said that one consequence, we saw this with the breakup of Yugoslavia and so on, one consequence of breaking up nation states into smaller units is that some of the regional and other tensions that all inevitably exist start to be exposed within a smaller stage. And it would be, I think, we'd be overly optimistic not to think that there are within Scotland, and I'm not thinking simply of things like sectarianism and so on, but significant regional differences. There's a kind of myth of this idea that somehow Scotland enjoys a degree of integrity, cultural, social unity and so on within itself that somehow means that we're problem free. In fact, much of the, of the tensions and difficulties that any small country faces and features have to some extent been absorbed and concealed by being part of this larger union in which Scots have moved freely north and south of the borders and others have done so. Uh, likewise, one great danger that face it faces with the breakup of the United Kingdom is you get a kind of intensification of some of the divisions that already exist. So some, some, real some, for England some ugly aspects respect, of society I, I, may well emerge. I, I think very much so. Yeah, yeah. That's a real danger. Is Ruth Davison, is that a real danger? Done has actually provided a larger stage. Ruth Davison, oh, is, is the, in, in, this multi, in this diverse multicultural world, this, this globalized world, you clearly believe we face those challenges better within the, the structure of a British state, but there's also a strong current of resentment in the rest of the UK that they're paying for this. They're paying for uh, the way Scotland lives at the moment. Wouldn't the best way to lance that boil be to go the route of Stuart Maxwell, full independence? Right, there's about seven questions in there, so if I, if I may pick and choose the ones that We've I answer. We've got time. All right. well, oh, super. Never tell the woman that there's enough time for her to talk. Uh, in terms of what John was talking about, let's not over, overstate this. I mean, everybody that's at the table on this is part of a democratic process, and we're all Democrats and we want to be part of that. Nobody is, is suggesting or scaremongering in any way that this is going to go into violence. Do we see things that we don't like that are being said? Yes, we do. I don't appreciate your colleague saying that anybody that supports a different political party that's not the SNP is anti-Scottish. Yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, this is a debate, this is a debate about words, it's a debate of ideas, and it's a debate about what the future of Scotland should be, what we want the future of our nation to be. Now, I happen to believe... The future of the UK is our angle this morning. Well, I happen to believe that Scotland stands taller, shouts louder, you know, is stronger for being part of a larger union. I think the union has served us well down the years. Greater than I, the sum of the parts, that, that argument. It's, pardon? The union is greater than the sum of Absolutely the parts. Absolutely the sum of its part. I think Scots have contributed a huge amount to the United Kingdom, and I think we've got a lot back from it. And, and I think that for me, being Scottish and British, I wear both nationality lightly, but I don't want somebody to take the British part of me away. I don't you feel know, no feeling British makes me feel any less Alan, Scottish than I am. Could you explain then, Ruth, mm. why uh, the independent report in the 1970s that was commissioned by the Conservative Party, the Macron report, which stated that if Scotland was to nationalise its oil industry in the 1970s, it would have one of the hardest currencies in Europe. There would be an embarrassing budget surplus. And that report was suppressed by both Conservatives and Labour and kept from the Scottish people. Well, something that, that was you, a basic deception that was perpetrated on behalf of the British government against the Scottish people. Something that you might not know was the entire North Sea oil revenue of 2010 was a third of the Scottish welfare bill. So the price of oil goes up and down. It's Why not do you think the Scottish the welfare bill is so high? Why is the Scottish welfare bill so high? Because of the recession, because of the policies perpetrated by successive governments in Westminster. But, frankly, I think the welfare bills that's why so high because of the status of the Scottish Labour that's been entrenched for many, many years. But that would be the argument I would make, Sandy, particularly in my part of Glasgow. Sandy, yeah, as, as a businessman, how do you see the future? And is there, is, is there a lot of, in the business community, is there sufficient candour about this debate? I think uh, the business community is uh, largely keeping its head below the parapet and nobody's really willing to put, uh, uh, their he you know, raise their head and actually say what they think. So I think there's a real danger there. We de do need to have an open debate about what this means for what business. Unless they be accused of being unpatriotic. Correct. Yeah. I spend increasing amounts of my time in London and what I detect already is complete lack of understanding why the Scots are trying to tear the Union apart. That's leading to resentment, and I can already detect that. I was in London for a couple of days this week. Um, our two, our largest public private sector employers are the banks and the supermarkets, whether we like it or not, they are English companies. And I'd be extremely concerned about the impact which, they, which the whole thing may have on um, 
the way the English look at the Scots and what um, impact that that may have if you think that England is today our largest single export market we want to make sure that we have still got the ability to trade freely in our largest single export market. But this morning, <laughs> this morning, speaking to Andrew, Alex Salmon promised lower corporate tax rates and with the huge wealth in the natural resources in Scotland, couldn't Scotland, akin to Norway, be a tremendously successful independent nation attractive for business? I think that's, um, at a conceptual level, that sounds terrific. My day job, <laughs> I uh, help people to start new technology companies and I work could with... I, I and if I could just a second, Ruth. Um, got you in so you've in you. no chance of getting finance unless you've got a terrific business plan, a strong management team, yeah. uh, and you stand up to rigorous diligence. Um, and an investor puts his money into something without those three things, he'll lose it. At the moment, I think the Scots are being asked to invest, uh, by extension or by analogy, we're being asked to invest in a company which has got no, bus no business plan, uh, no visibility in its management team post-independence. Um, post mm -hmm. And um, uh, basically, I had a look at the, um, the referendum document which appeared this week. It's all about the process. There is nothing in it whatsoever about the substance. <laughs> I think, I think the reason that support for independence is growing can actually be because of the arguments that are articulated on this side of the hall this morning. We've had the usual scare stories. We've even had a suggestion that we need to be protected in Scotland in case we d dissolve into a Balkan-type conflict. It's unbelievably depressing view of the people of Scotland. Now, this is a basic issue of fairness. I lived in England for a long period of time. I understand people there are very fair-minded. I would wonder at the situation in England, if we had a general election, and at the end of the general election, one party had one member of parliament, and they said, we're the government. We're going to be in charge of economic policy, and we're going to be the prime minister. People in England would laugh at that. That's the situation we've got now. We have one conservative member of parliament, we're and they, we're one conservative <laughs> member of parliament in Scotland, and they are in charge of our country. No other country would put got up this. Lib Dems. Now, thing, got a lot of Lib Dems in Scotland. And they're in 8% in the opinion polls in the opinion poll country, uh, published this morning. But the other thing I would say, on the day that Alex Salmon launched the independence referendum, on the week that David Cameron, in fact, raised this issue in particular, there were two facts that came out, two important interesting statistics. One, one in five of our children in Scotland live in poverty, and next year we will have record investment in North Sea oil. We have, we have generated 300 million pounds of royalties in North Sea oil, and one in five children in our country are living in poverty, and you are telling us we shouldn't be changing. If I may, well, look, I think there's a really big issue of you seem to oil. Think that if, this, if we were running if, this country, people would be incapable. Unique, no, I, I, I you would never go argument. to any other that's country of argument. five million people and say, uh, Denmark you're, couldn't do it, no, Switzerland couldn't do it, Norway couldn't do it. It's not the size of the country. You're exactly. actually saying exactly. it's to do with us, it's to do with Scotland, no. that we're uniquely incapable. No, it's exactly. an astonishing no, point no, for you to no, make. No, it's not the size of the country, Ewan. It's not the size of the country. It's what that country... You think it's Scotland. That's your problem. It's to do with us. You think we're incapable. I have I've never said that. I have ne that's never been my Do you go to argument. Denmark and tell my them they're a country of five million uh, people and therefore they're incapable? You should to a different point of view. That is not my argument. <laughs> it is not, it is, it's not the size of the country. It's what that country chooses to do. I think you tackle poverty So we're incapable. I think it's to do with Scotland, no, not I the think, size of the country. Not at all. No, I've not but you said it's not you the size of the country. You you country. You'll, be, you'll be on the naughty step in a minute. You know that, don't you? I think this is part of the problem. In a minute. I do think you have to hear different points of view. I think you tackle poverty-based by actually redistributing resources across the United Kingdom. Now, in fact, every day since the SA, every month since the SNP have been elected in Scotland, child poverty has gone up. So I would I'd be a bit less self-righteous about tackling child poverty. We don't have, we don't have the power to do anything about it. it. That's the whole argument. They say you never have the power. Have it no is power about how it is about how you use those resources. And you have you have. We've just heard the first minister say this morning he wants to cut corporation tax. You want to Absolutely. cut taxes to the bankers. That's not what I would want to do. I would want to make sure you raise taxes to make sure you help tackle poverty in Scotland. And I think that's a policy you should be arguing for. Mark, do you agree? Ewan, what, 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 how will, will Scotland be all right? I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's, 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 a, there's a, you're off the naughty step now. You're back in, you always were back in favour. But with the, with the deficit about what it takes in and what it pays out, uh, you're relying on the oil revenues, aren't you? Because well, you're we're not, not going to get that, all that money from the Barnett formula. And there are a lot of people watching now elsewhere in the UK who realise that the spend per capita 
capita in Scotland is far higher well, well, than where well, they live. Actually, we're not we're not just relying on the oil revenue. And actually, what, since what, how are you going to make the, mo the money to make the books well, balance? Uh, well, then? actually, in four of the five years before the crash, Scotland was in surplus. Now, for the ten years from 2000, the UK up. as a whole was in deficit. But I think the argument. But, oh, there's no, another, no, there's no, another no, point no, here. No, it's a very but, important point as well because I mean, we're talking about Alex Salmon this morning, who is uh, you know clearly a giant in British politics, never mind Scottish politics. But can we trust his vision? This is a man who, who encouraged Sir Fred Goodwin in the takeover that RBS did on uh, ABN AMRO. His finance minister, John Swinney, wrote congratulating Sir Fred Goodwin on that. Well, well in those circumstances, at the time, no, no, I don't think so, because, I mean, it's great thing with, 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 it's great in the hindsight, the former First Min Labour First Minister, Jack McConnell, uh, suggested that Fred Goodwin should get his knighthood. I don't criticise him for that, because at the time, people were thinking this is a successful Scottish business. We now, of course, know something very different. But the well, might we know issue, something very issue, different post-independence yeah, well, about whether this will be yeah, a successful indeed, project? Indeed, the issue of money, I think, is very important. Now, you're talking about, is this good for the United Kingdom? At the moment, we have a situation where there is some unpleasantness, because people in England and some of the more right-wing commentators will say, look, we up here, we're living the high life with our free tuition fees and free prescriptions on the back of people in England. I actually look at our oil resources. I look at Norway with its £550 billion oil fund, and I think, why don't we put that to good use? Now, if we actually had independence, the revenue raised in Scotland would stay in Scotland. The revenue raised in England would stay in England, and we could meet as equals what and discuss the partnership. Surely that's Sandy, so much better. What about the oil, business? Business? The, the, the oil? The oil things. If, if what's emerging from this? We started off with culture, and I think Scotland, Wales, and Ireland have got a much stronger cultural identity than <coughs> England. But if this is what's emerging from this, is the elephant in the room? It's still about oil. Now, North Sea oil production peaked in 1997. It's 25% off its peak. What I know about oil is that it will, North Sea oil will run out the lifetime of my children, my grandchildren. <laughs> so, if we have a vision for the future of Scotland, that's a long time. Long uh, time. Well. Um, I think people, no, 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 Alex no, no, Salmon no, no, no. is choosing to have the referendum in the 700th anniversary, was it Bannockburn, Bannockburn? Yeah, something yeah, like that? So yeah, that was a long time ago as well. Bannockburn, something I, I, like that. La let's look this, a long that's time that's into that's the future yeah. and think not about what, we, what oil resources we can get, let's think about our children and our children's children exactly what and what kind of country we're point. leaving for <laughs> them, which has nothing to do with oil and everything to to Hands do with up. creating employment, uh, sustainable employment for okay. our next generation. Sandy, thank you. Uh, yes, let's just get the microphone over here. What would you like to say good morning to you? Good morning. It's just to go back on Yoon's two quick points. points. Quick points. Yeah, Yoon mentioned the uh, fact about poverty. Now, poverty is one of the social issues and the social problems that we do have in Scotland, right? And the other point was about the oil. The, the oil will only last about 50 years or so, and that's what's been forecast. I would just like to add that Scotland has enjoyed prosperity for over 300 years with the Act of Union in 1707. Now, we cannot deny that. Can. After, and after that, the Victorians have increased the wealth of Scotland. And I think it would be devastating if Scotland splits. The profits of empire are all around us. We, mm. Well, we can look at the yeah, castles we have. Mm. It's not an insecure country. There's people, Scots, who have prospered in Scotland and they're able to migrate down to England and get work. There is no work in Scotland at the moment. And this is not another issue that we haven't touched on. That's it. Yes, sir. I think it's really important to emphasise that this debate is much less about rejecting Britain and much more about Scotland embracing itself, empowering itself, gaining the powers to engage in the world. It's not a separatist movement, it's about inclusion and participation. It's not about the past, all these historical references that we're making this debate. It's about Scotland's future. What sort of government do we want? Do we want it to reflect our values, our priorities? Do we want it to help us achieve our ambitions? And I think when the Scottish people get the chance to take that opportunity, they will grasp it with both hands and we can move confidently into the 21st century. What about, what about England? Will the England be better off for the it? The nation will of Wales England be better off for should it? engage in its own uh, process of trying to establish its own political identity of where it wants to be in the 21st century. In terms of Wales and the north of England and these social democrats, the question I ask them is if they do not want Scotland to go alone and become a beacon of social democracy in these islands, then what do we do? Do we follow the 
the path of the Tories or do we follow Labour for another right. few generations promising they're going to deal okay. with poverty and not of, do it in our lifetimes? a beacon of social democracy. Some, yeah. some are arguing all week it's not a beacon of social democracy mm. on match day in Glasgow, yeah. is it? You know, but, but look, there you, are other problems. Right. But you, you began by talking about the United Kingdom and quite understandably given where we are and given the personalities that are present, we're focusing on, on, on the needs and interests of Scotland in particular. But I do think if we think about this, I mean, it's all very well to say, well, there's only the past, and that's all part of you. The historians are talking about the past. But, I mean, the past is just, was a, pre was a present once and was a future once and so on. We're talking about things extended in time. And one of the things that the Union did was create a new kind of entity called Britain. And Scotland doesn't, needn't see itself as losing in that. It can see itself as gaining, just as what we're going to be talking later on, I think, about same-sex marriage. Very just soon, as people in enter into unities, it creates something larger. I mean, I entirely say it's, it's exceedingly important that Scots be proud, that they generate their cultural identity and so on. But those things that happen, whether it's with the Enlightenment, whether it's in, in painting and so on, these great Scottish movements all went on within the Union. There's no reason why that that's going to stop now. And what I am concerned about, thank you, but I am concerned about the, the idea that we give up, give up something that was an enrichment and then face ourselves and say, what have we oh, got and one now? of the final points, an enrichment. We have an enrichment of our culture through things like the welfare state, which Scotland wants to maintain and England wants to get rid of. Much of what was best in the history of the United Kingdom, the Scots want to stand by. The Scots' belief in investment in education, the Scots' insistence on a priority in health. These are the things we are holding to here and which both the Tories and Labour are fritting away in the South. was releasing Al McGrath here. Uh, and releasing Al McGrath. Well, Kenny McCaskill said this. That. Justice Minister said that the Scots are a compassionate people. What, what, what does that mean? What it means is this, that we, um, to have a society in which you're pursuing the politics of greed, constantly telling people you are a taxpayer, but these spongers, these scroungers are trying to get money away from you, building class hatred, that is something we are passionately opposed to. Let's, um, let's have a quick show of hands. Um, who supports, uh, unrepresentative of course, <laughs> this is not binding by the way. <laughs> right. um, who supports the Union? Put your hand up if you support the Union. And who wants outright independence? It's pretty evenly who's split. Not sure? who, who's, <laughs> is it, no, I'm not going to put that. We're not going there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for all taking part in that.